Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, Professor Jane Mansbridge. Welcome to Sky Lounge Prince in the heart of Antwerp for the conferral of the 2021 Honorary Degree in Social Sciences. My name is Anke. I will be your hostess this evening in this beautiful location. This ceremony should have taken place a year ago in a different location, but for reasons we're all familiar with, that wasn't possible. That's why we are so delighted that tonight is finally the night for the ceremony. Honorary Dr. Jane Mansbridge will shortly be teaching a masterclass on the future of democracy. Afterwards, we will hold a Q&A session to answer the questions you send in through the registration module. But if you have any questions during the masterclass, you can ask them using the chat function on the YouTube channel. In the chat, you can also find the link with the instructions and the code for the poll that will be held during the presentations. Then, after the Q&A session, we will proceed to the conferral of the honorary degree. But first, I would like to give the floor to Professor Petra Meyer, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. Mansbridge, esteemed Rector Van Goetem, Dean Elmendorf, dear colleagues and guests with us today, I have the great pleasure and also the honor to welcome you all to the masterclass Dr. Mansbridge will give on what has already been mentioned, the future of democracy. Dear Dr. Mansbridge, if I may, I would like to briefly introduce you to our public. It is not that you and your work require a lot of introduction. You are an internationally leading scholar in the field of democratic theory. Your work has found its way to many classrooms and bibliographies, and it was translated into material helping politicians, civil servants, and others to fulfill their role in a better way. Telling is the fact that you won the Johann Skeid Prize in political science three years ago. Johann Skeid, or I think it's Skitter in uh, Swedish, was a Swedish statesman who back in 1622 donated to Uppsala University in order to establish a professorship in political science. The Johann Skitter Prize is the most famous prize in political science, also known as the Nobel Prize for political scientists. You are one of the 25 political scientists around the globe who have received this prize so far. That says it all. Dear public, Jane Mansbridge is Charles F. Adams Professor of Political Leadership and Democratic Values at the Kennedy School of Government of Harvard University. She has contributed tremendously to our understanding of the principles underlying and the dynamic guiding contemporary democracy and, more particularly, the paradigmatic shifts in contemporary political thinking on democratic representation, participation, and activism. She has inspired a whole generation of scholars, especially in the field of ethnic and racial or gender studies, but also beyond, with her work focusing on principles for more inclusive political representation, everyday political activism, true deliberation, and a less adversary democracy. Indeed, your work focuses on the interplay between political representation and participation, the power relations at play, and what to do to make democracy better, stronger. The democratic values in your academic title are very dear to you. Throughout your career, you argued for a better representation of marginalized and discriminated groups, but you are especially triggered by a more direct participation of citizens in the governing of a society. You have covered the field from workplace democracy to what is currently known as deliberative democracy and conflict. Your work pushes us to think about the balance between conflict and common or shared interests. Key to your work, such as your earlier books on adversary democracy or why we lost the Equal Rights Amendment, but also your more recent work is the importance of listening and deliberation. The two go hand in hand listening to the adversary party, to those who do not agree with us, another. You underline the need to listen, not only in an instrumentalist way to get the information one wants, but also as a sign of respect and in order to feed dialogue. Deliberation, you argue, quote, in contrast to slogans, shouting, and Twitter outbursts, requires questioning others, listening hard to them, and then either finding some common ground or clarifying conflict." Unquote. You argue that democracy is about contest and that it needs contest, 
but also about deliberation and how to get it right. There is no deliberation if one does not listen to the other side or the other sides. Your work could not be more timely or suitable for the Belgian context. This morning, Thomas Gunzik, a leading columnist in the French-speaking Belgian press, explored what could happen if we would involve the public in a deliberation on the further evolution of the Belgian state architecture beyond its current federal structure. In a hilarious column, he wondered how the first article of our constitution, stating that Belgium is a federal state composed of communities and regions, how it could turn out. Now, it should also say that Belgium is constituted of people, diverse social groups, that the term Belgium might bother some. The geographic entity might need some relabeling. Well, he ended up with a very long and completely incomprehensible article for our constitution. He very well also showed us how difficult it is to find common ground beyond a sum of particular interests. I'll send him work, I'll send him your work, copies of your work, I promise you. But this is not what we're here for today. The Faculty of Social Sciences, the University of Antwerp, value scholars with sharp minds who reach beyond their discipline. And this is what you do, Dr. Mansbridge. Dear guests, Dr. Mansbridge's aim is to strengthen democracy. You recognize the fluidity of democracy, how it permanently needs to evolve to do itself justice, because it is a democracy. Your work reflects a critically engaged concern about the way democracy advances. Social and political life is more than a study object to you, which you analyze from a distance. You're concerned about what is going on in society, what new issues pop up and trends show around the corner, and what this means for society at large and the people who compose it. You never forget that you're actually reflecting upon human beings rather than political actors. Your academic work is not only outstanding, it is above all meaningful. Dr. Mainsbridge, dear Jenny, we are more than curious to hear what you have to say about the future of democracy. The floor is yours. I need to unmute myself and I am now unmuted and I will say thank you again for that wonderful introduction which makes me feel truly understood, makes me feel that my work has, um, has, has, has reached a, a, a brain and a heart in you and uh, that I very much appreciate. So I'm going to um, go right ahead then and welcome you all to this discussion of the future of democracy across the Atlantic by Zoom. We might not have been able to get together if it hadn't been for Zoom. So let me just go and speak to what um, the point of getting together today. I think you all know um, that in the climate crisis, we're facing a crisis of not just our generation, but many generations. This may be the most the most important crisis. This is the most important crisis the world has ever faced. I want to talk about the structure of the climate crisis and argue uh, and point out that um, a good climate, a stable climate is a free use good. Um, and then I'll explain the problems that that leads leads uh, to. And I'll ask, how can we improve democracy so that we're in a better shape to handle uh, really uh, extraordinarily difficult problems like this? I'll talk about legislative negotiation and what I call the civic lottery, discursive representation, rec recursive representation. So let me just start with the crisis um, and the free rider problem. I'm going to start you heard there was going to be a poll, and at the end of this exercise, there will be a poll. I'm going to start with an exercise that I think will let every one of you understand the structure of the free rider problem, sometimes called the collective action problem. And it's as important a structure, a logical structure, as um, supply and demand. It's a little bit more complex but it's an incredibly important structure, which you, I think you will understand after this exercise. So first, 
I'm just going to give everyone who's listening here today uh, an imaginary 100 euros. You now have 100 euros. And you can now give me, through the poll, either zero euros or 100 euros. Nothing in between just because of simplicity of calculation. And then I'm going to be a doubling machine. I will double everything I get and give it back to everyone here equally. So I'll, I'll take everything I get, double it, and give it back to you equally. So if you give me the 100 euros, you'll get back your equal share of that doubled. Come on, hello. I'm trying to story catcher people. There we go. Um, I'm sorry. Somehow, aha. All right. A <clears throat> little bit of problem with a clicker here. Um, so if you give me 100 euros, you'll get back the equal share. But if you give me zero, you'll get back the equal share of what everyone else gave me, doubled, and you'll have kept your original 100 euros. So you'll leave with 100 euros more than everyone who gave 100 euros. So you can see that it pays you to give zero, because then you'll leave with 100 more than everyone else. Now, if everyone calculates that, as they should, it's a rational calculation, they'll, everyone will give zero. Zero will come up to this wonderful doubling machine that doubles your value without any work on your part. You'll completely re uh, waste the resource of that doubling machine. So, there's no trick to this. You can just think about it. It's, that was, it's a logic that was discovered between 1950 and 1965, um, and it had a tremendous effect on the social sciences, but no one has as fully, I think, understood its uh, repercussions for democracy, which we're going to go through right now. So you've thought about it. Are you going to give zero or 100? Will you please go to the poll and give either zero or 100, knowing that whatever is given generally, collectively, will be doubled by me and returned to you all equally. Okay, everyone, please do that now. There's a 20 minute wait, 20 second wait while you do the poll. So I'll wait for that. Um, maybe, uh, while we're, while we're waiting for the poll results, I'll just describe what's going on. You've just experienced what's called the common pool version of the free rider problem. And what you need to know is that doubled money is a free use good. I hope everyone will leave this talk today with the words free use good in their minds and how that how important that is, because a free use good is one that you benefit from even when you haven't contributed to producing it. So let's say you gave zero euros, you will benefit from what everybody else gave and that doubled, even when you haven't produced it. Um, so um, there's that logic tends to lead to the under production of the good. Um, those Think, we think of things like roads without tolls. Most of the roads, roads you uh, drive on don't have tolls. But, and that means they're free use goods. You can use them. Okay, what percentage is that? I can't quite read the percent. Or is it it's still, the results are still coming in. I can see the things jumping up and down. Um, so we'll wait till everyone's given, given um, that and then we'll come up with the results. Um, so, uh, wait a minute, I'll go back and just give you some more examples of free use goods because that's, uh, please remember the concept of a free use good. Once it's produced, anyone can use it, like a good harbor that doesn't have a toll in it, good roads, and of course, a clean air, and of course, a stable climate. Once these things have been produced, clean air, clean water, a stable climate, fish in the sea to fish, anyone can take from it. Anyone can breathe that air. Anyone can swim in that water or drink that water without having to pay for it. Um, oopsie, sorry. 
So now do we have the final results? Can someone tell me if we have the final result? And can someone tell me the uh, percentage here? This is not in percentage terms. Um, I can't quite see the percentages. Jane, I can tell so, you the result. I can tell you the yes, result. You. Nine, yes, uh, almost 90% gave 100 euros. Oh my gosh, 90%? Really? Yes, nine zero. That's the, that's the highest amount I have ever had speaking on this subject. <laughs> I actually gave the same uh, exercise when I uh, was awarded the Shooter Prize in Sweden. Now, Sweden, you know, we all know, is one of the most sort of communal countries on the universe, and they had 85%. So I have never, never received 85%. Uh, a 90%. So when I when I planned the lecture, in fact, I thought that maybe 65% would contribute because that's what I get from my very wonderful students at the Kennedy School. All right, let me ask all of you who contributed that 90 those that 90%. Let me ask you why you did this. Because you could have. Now, of course, that hundred euros was imaginary, um, so it wasn't really particularly costly, if it had actually been real 100 euros that you held in your hand, you might have been a little bit less likely to give it in. But supposing you gave it in, and many of you would have, even if it was actual real money, why? Well, I think part of it is a sense of duty. You would have said to yourself, well, you know, I should, I ought to do this, using the word ought or duty. What if everyone acted that way? And we might call that a kind of everyday Kantianism. It's it's based on should, it's based on duty, it's based on ought. It's a it's a cognitive. Or you could have also thought, um, I don't want to let everybody else down. And so the mixture of duty and solidarity, that emotional and cognitive mixture, which you can't tease apart in actuality. You can tease it apart analytically. I just teased it apart for you, attributing the ought to duty and the solidarity to kind of emotional. But in our real lives, they're, they're very mixed up. So here they are, solidarity and duty all uh, together. And that's what I call, call when in our human lives together, the core of solidarity and duty that allows us to solve these problems, allows us to build roads, allows us to solve climate problems. Um, but if there's that 10%, I'm good, I had it 65%, um, but it's actually 90% among you. Um, but there's, what would happen if we ran the exercise again? I'm actually not sure what would happen with such a, a large percent giving. But usually with a, a somewhat smaller percent giving, let's say a 75% or 65% giving, the next time you ran it, what, what do you, uh, if, if we were here in person, I'd love you to sort of put your finger up or put your finger down, but in your own mind, put your finger up. Do you think that there would be more people giving or do you think there would be fewer people giving if we did this a second time? Just ask yourself that question. Come up with the answer in your own mind. Well, it would probably be fewer people, at least if this were the, you know, a 65 or 75% group giving, because there would always be, there's always those people who were right there on the margin. And they look at the people, let's say the 35% who gave zero and thought, ah, they got away with murder. Maybe I'm, I'm not going to be the sucker next time. Maybe I'll, I'll just keep my euros the next time. And so the next time a fewer people, and the next time fewer people, and the next time fewer people, this has happened over and over again in, in laboratory studies, and it's called unraveling, that the, the core of duty and solidarity unravels. So what do we do to, um, to try to keep that core together? We, we usually, human beings, um, put around it what I call a little periphery of coercion. So those of you who are academics, imagine being asked to serve on a committee. And whether you do a really good job on that committee or whether you kind of shirk on that committee and, real, and do your own writing instead, um, and kind of let some of the other people carry the, the bigger burden. 
Um, and then when you come to, to get a raise, the chair of your department says, um, excuse me, I went backwards. Uh, the chair of your department says, um, you know, um, your committee work, I wish we, we could have a, um, possibly a bit better committee work uh, from you. And you know, that's a, a slight threat. That's, that's the periphery of coercion. You know that if you're a really terrible member of the department and let everybody else do the work, you might not get a raise next time. Of course, mostly raises come from your written work and so forth, but there is a slight periphery of coercion and we know this in our everyday life. We know that if we're roommates with people, of course they put away the, wash the dishes and put them away and so forth. But if they don't do that and we scowl at them when we get kind of angry at them, that's our little periphery of coercion that make, that keeps the duty and solidarity going together. So, that's that's what I mean. So what we want to do is make that coercion minimal. We don't want to have it take over the whole game. So make that that's the moral core coercive periphery model that I that I have. Um, what the coercion does extraordinarily, we think of co coercion and duty and solidarity as being opposites in many ways, and they are. But actually, that coercion it, it can be thought of as creating an ecological niche for the duty and solidarity to survive, because otherwise um, they would, um, the, darn it, I'm sorry, I keep touching this thing and, and I'm not used to using this particular kind of clicker. Um, so I, you'll have to excuse me for going back and forth. But the point is that this is an extremely important point, that you need a little bit of coercion to keep the solidarity and duty going so that the few people, the 10% who didn't give, that they don't under, gradually undermine the motives of the people who um, did give. Now, one way, a tiny bit of coercion might have been for, um, for, for, you, for, for those polls to have your names on it. So your friends would know, oh, Jenny didn't give. Huh. Hmm. I didn't realize Jenny was that kind of person. That would be just a little bit of coercion that would push me over the edge from not giving to giving. So we want it minimal. We want it to create an ecological niche for solidarity to flourish. So we don't want it to drive out duty and solidarity. And most important, and this is where democracy comes in, for that coercion to work, it has to be legitimate. Illegitimate coercion is just going to turn everyone against it. So that's our goal. Our first goal is to increase duty and solidarity in our communities. And our second goal is to increase the legitimacy of the coercion that we use. So of course, the number of free rider problems in Europe is going to increase over the next years um, because we get more and more interdependent. And the more interdependent we get, the more we create these free rider problems. And the same thing is true with the planet. The more interdependent we get, the more free rider problems we're going to have, um, and such as climate change. These are, we're going to need free use goods. We're going to need goods that can't just be paid for like, through private property. And then that means we're going to have to use a lot of duty and solidarity with coercion around. Um, now, can you t remind me when, um, when this, a lecture is supposed to stop, uh, excuse me, um, but maybe, maybe not. Okay, so let's, so you understand the logic. Increasing interdependence leads to increasing free rider problems, which leads to increasing need for state coercion. And so therefore we must find ways to make that state coercion increasingly legitimate. Why do you think so many people don't trust government these days? Part of the reason is that there's just more and more and more coercion. And we're gonna need more and more and more coercion. So it's absolutely critical to make that coercion legitimate. So how do we do that? I think we can't do it with the 18th century framework of democracy that we have. It was very, very good. We shouldn't scrap it. We should keep it. We should improve it, but we need much more. And I'm just going to throw out three possible ideas, um, three things that have worked a bit, um, but 
but really I think that you all should be thinking you're the creative minds you're the future um, so please don't just take my thinking think yourself how can I make how can we and my how can I and my colleagues make democracy more legitimate so here's the first one that um, I've been working with legislative negotiation um, and so, some of you may be in schools, public policy schools, law schools, or have been in schools, public policy schools, law schools, business schools. Every one of those schools these days has a course on negotiation. It's usually one of the most popular courses because it teaches extremely practical skills. And one point there is to look for the interests behind the positions. What does that mean? If I find out what you really want, underneath what you're asking for, maybe I can find a way of giving you what you really want that's at less cost to me than what you've been asking for. And I'm gonna give you a little quick example here. Oh, by the way, this entire idea was created by a woman named Mary Parker Follett, who died in 1933. She never had an academic position, of course, because women couldn't have academic positions in those days. Um, she did lecture. She was a very popular lecturer among business people. Um, and she invented this concept, integrative negotiation, which has been redubbed win-win negotiation. And I'll show you an example here. Think about a little gas station, let's call it. And we are, have a, a company, Texoil, who wants to buy that gas station. Now the Texoil company can't pay more than what is this, $500,000? Um, not more for various reasons. That's absolutely fixed amount. And what do they want? What are their interests? Well, they want to increase the number of gas stations they have. They need a manager for the station. They need that particular location. Uh, they want profits, of course. And then there's the service station owner. He can't sell for less than 553, is it? Um, uh, because he has uh, a plan to uh, buy a boat, uh, get some money and buy a boat, uh, and sail around the world with his wife. That's been his. There, the two, the two of them have had this for uh, this dream for a long time: sail around the world. And they've calculated out how much they'll need for food and clothing, how much for boat repairs, um, how much they'll need for savings once they get back, because he's going to have to spend some time getting another job when he gets back, um, some money to get the boat ready, and so forth. And what are their interests? Their interests are to pursue their life dream. To they want uh, security for when they come back. And the man is, the wife has cancer. The reason they're doing this right now is the man is worried about his wife's health and they want to do this right now so that they'll be able to fulfill their dream. Okay, can anybody see a deal that they can make? I mean, if you look at it, there's, there's what you call no zone of possible agreement. That's called ZOPA, no zone of possible agreement because the textile folks can't pay more than five, hundred thousand dollars and the service station owner can't sell it that's his bottom that's his absolutely bottom price so if you look at that just think about it for a second uh, it i'm sure no one will be able to think of the answer because people can't think of the answer until they've really given this a lot of thought but just i'll pause for one minute to see if you can think of how in the world they could make a deal with this situation, where the interests are, they want to increase the stations, they need a manager, they want that location, they want increased profits. And the station, service station owner, wants to pursue their dream and sail around the world. They want security and a cushion for when they return. Um, and they were very worried about his wife's health. Does anybody have any, any thoughts? Anything in the chat? I'll just go on. Okay, the deal is you, oops, the deal is you make the service station owner the manager of the gas station when he returns. Texoil needs a manager. You see, I, I put that up in red. And the gas station owner needs the security. He's put aside 75,000 as 
uh, to, so, to hold them through until he gets another job. But if he's promised a job, Texoil wins because he's, he's managed this gas station for a very long time. They get a great manager. And he doesn't have to worry at all about a job when he returns. So that's the kind of deal you make. Now, how can you get that deal? You can only find that deal if you just walk in and say, well, I can't pay more than 500,000. Well, sorry, I can't, I can't sell it from less than 553,000. That's that, you have to talk, you have to listen, you have to ask questions. Why is it that you, what, what, are, the, what are the reasons you have to ask 553? And then probe and probe and ask questions and listen hard. And then you say, Oh, I see. So part of that is the security that you, sorry, accidentally tapped that thing again. Part of it's the security. What if we made you an offer, for, you know, to run the gas station? Then that's how you get the deal. That's what every negotiation course in the whole world teaches. So now what, we, what we've done is we've taken legislative negotiation and we've used the same framework to teach people in legislatures how to negotiate better. And they can learn just the way people in business schools do. And right now the Library of Congress is giving these lessons to congressional staff and they're lining up in the aisle, so to speak, to take these classes because they think they work. They know they work, they see them working. So that's one way to make democracy work better. And then you might ask, well, what are other institutions that make us listen to one another. And here we have the civic lottery, the democratic lottery. Democratic lottery means selecting a random selection of citizens um, who then um, create what, what are called deliberative mini publics. Um, excuse me, I'm just gonna look to see when this. <laughs> myself the, uh, when I go to, um, I go to 155. Okay, I'm on, in good shape. Excuse me for taking a little bit of time to look at the schedule. Here is the second important uh, way of thinking about things. You can take a random selection of citizens and bring them together for a weekend, sometimes a day, a weekend's better, to deliberate over an important issue and then give advice to the legislature. A version of this called deliberative polls has taken place in, in 28, 29 countries around the world, uh, Ghana, Uganda, Mongolia, um, China, France, America, of course, UK, Canada, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Citizens' assemblies, um, Another version, we've had Canada on voting systems, Ireland on abortion, France on climate, and in your own country, the, one of the most innovative versions is actually connected with the um, uh, German-speaking community parliament, the East Belgian parliament. This is a world leader in understanding how to use these. We're in the experimental phase now, and this had to be postponed because of the pandemic. They decided not to try to do it by Zoom. They wanted it to work, and, and so they ma made sure that it was done. Um, they wanted to do it face-to-face, -face, so they've had to postpone it. But it's extremely um, on the forefront. Uh, and um, Madrid, Bogota, many other places have the bring together a random selection of citizens to take an issue which politicians uh, are kind of worried about. And often when you increase coercion, that's something that politicians don't want to do. They don't want to increase coercion because they know they'll be blamed for it. But if a group of citizens comes together and says, you know, we need to increase taxes, or we need to do X or we need to do Y. That is something that not everybody will want to do. But if a deliberated group says that this is important for the country, important for the world, that sometimes carries more legitimacy than a parliament uh, does these days. So these groups, which are almost all advisory, except in Mongolia where it's uh, required for a constitutional amendment, these groups can produce extra legitimacy. Um, and he, oh, here, here's something that happens in some of these groups. This is the most re a recent group, a one in America. Um, this September before last September, 
Republicans in the group got much more moderate on their views on immigration. And Democrats uh, got less enthusiastic about very costly policies. I was in one group with one woman and she said, oh, I didn't realize these policies that I was in favor of cost money. <laughs> oh, no. um, so you see people uh, kind of converging. There's another version of this, which is uh, something called deliberative town halls in which elected representatives get together on, uh, on the internet, like as in Zoom, um, 175 constituents randomly selected, not the activists. These are the, a random selection of constituents. They read background materials and then they interact with their representative through the internet for, um, for an hour. Now, obviously, Oh, darn, darn it, excuse me. Uh, so, so sorry. Um, obviously, an hour, not every one of those 175 can have a say, but th at the end, they actually um, find that m other people have asked the question they want, and, and almost all of the 175 leave these, these uh, interactions very positive. They're much more likely to vote afterwards, much more likely to participate. They're more informed and they're extremely enthusiastic about the pro uh, about what they've done and they talk about it with their friends. So now we know that even in the United States, which has really huge constituencies, it's a big country. Nevertheless, if every representative gave two sessions a week all year long, after six years, they would engage one quarter of their constituents. So you can imagine if this became a standard part of democracy, all of us could be expected to be tapped in this random way once or twice, at least during our lifetime. Our friends would be tapped, we'd be talking about it. If someone was tapped, talking about what they had said to their representative, what their representative said to them, we would talk about it over supper, it would change the tenor of democracy and bring the citizens more closely into, and the representative could explain why uh, the issue was perhaps more complex than the citizens had realized to begin with. So this allows a really a genuine back and forth between the representative and the citizens in a way that we have never had in the history of democracy. So that's, then there's a final way of thinking about things, um, which is um, what I call recursive representation. Um, and there, um, what I mean by that is by recursive, I mean mutually responsive and ongoing respectful interaction between the representative and the constituent. A little bit like what we, not just a little bit like, very much like, exactly like what we, I just spoke about in the deliberative town halls. So, the question, it's a matter of listening and responding, questioning and responding on both sides. Um, one point that I'd like to make is that this recursiveness, this recursivity ought to happen in three legislative, three arenas. Not only the legislative one, which we just discussed, how the rep elected representatives can um, can get together with their constituents, a random sample of their constituents, uh, maybe an hour, uh, two hours a week, um, not, not a great amount of time to spend, but that amount of time spent co would cover over time a great number of people. Um, oh gosh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so there are uh, three, arenas, not only the legislative, but also the administrative and what I'm going to call the societal. And I'll explain what I mean by societal later. I just mean the NGOs, that whole arena of civil society. We can have recursivity in all three realms. So right now the model is, as you all know, a voter elects a representative, the representatives choose administrators, the administrators implement the laws on the citizens, and that's the story. A different story would be to have recursivity throughout the system. All of those little, those are little arrows, and it's the citizens having a recursive relationship with the elected representative. The elected representatives having recursive relationships with the administrators, listening, talking, discussing, 
and the administrators having recursive relationships with the citizens. And the, both the elected representatives and the administrators having recursive relationships with the civ civil society organizations, the unions, um, the NGOs, um, other groups that represent citizens in the, through civil society. That would be that whole buzzing uh, map of recursivity uh, would be the entire what I call the representative system because I think we th need to think of representation not just as legislative but that we are represented in many many ways through this much larger interactive system um, that brings us all together in a democracy. So, um, oops, okay, so I'm going to look through these different um, interactions or potential interactions and the dotted lines will show what's not really happening now and the solid line will show what's happening now. So right now we don't have very much in the way of recursive interaction with representatives. We certainly have meetings in which the citizens ask questions and often sh or shout uh, and make, make the citizens make their needs known or protests in which I walk down the street and, and shouting and I make my needs known, make my needs known. So the, that goes one way up to the representatives and then the representatives say back, I can't do that or yes, we'll try to do that or whatever. That's two way communication and it's good, it's good. It's very good, but it's not a matter of my then really processing what the representative says and coming back and say, okay, well, you say you're going to try, what's so hard? Um, and then the representative telling me what's so hard. And my saying, well, I don't think that should be so hard for the following reasons or whatever it might be. Think of any conversation that you have in your family or with your friends. That's the way we talk. That's the way human beings make progress. That's not the kind of relationship the citizens usually have with their elected representatives. Now the elected representatives do have that kind of uh, well, in the U.S., of course, we're going to, let me go back to this because, of course, the U.S. in the U.S., you do have that kind of relationship between the elected representatives and one form of citizen, namely huge big donors. Then the representatives really want to know what those donors think, and they get, you know, they go to dinner with them and so forth and so on. But this is a very tiny, tiny, and thank goodness you don't have quite as much of that in Belgium. Um, but what you do have is the elected representatives are in recursive contact with things like unions or various different kinds of NGOs. Um, representatives do consult. Representatives are on committees. That committee consults with a lot of societal representatives of one sort or another. So that's actually working relatively well. What's not working about it is it's not very equal. Um, it hasn't been, that system hasn't been looked at from a democratic perspective and said, you know, do, are we really, are the representatives really consulting in an egalitarian way? Um, just actually, so the next set, so if, if we have, as we just do, that's solid, that's happening, those elected representatives consulting with the societal representatives. But then problematically, the societal representatives are not consulting in a recursive way with their citizens. And I found this out myself uh, through one of the students in my class. He came from East Germany. He had been working, my class at the Kennedy School, he had been working in the EU and uh, he had worked himself up into a relatively medium level administrative position. He was young, uh, very smart, very good guy. And he was going back one Christmas to uh, drink with his buddies on the construction site that he used to work on um, when he was in uh, school. And they were complaining about the EU regulations uh, that applied to them. And he said, well, you know, the reason for that is X, Y, Z. And they said, huh, well, that makes sense. Why didn't anybody tell us? There hadn't been the union who had who had actually engaged in these in these interactions. I'm going to go backwards. The union had engaged in these interactions with um, with essentially the EU um, Council. Uh, it's not precisely. Um, uh, they hadn't bothered to have the um, 
they hadn't bothered to have a recursive relationship with their citizens and explain why these regulations, what, what the point of these regulations was. So that's a that's of course going to make the regulations less legitimate, much less legitimate. So uh, one more here, the administrators have very strong uh, relationships with societal representatives, just the way the elected representatives do. But again, those Hello, move along, please. Touching this and it's not moving. Trying to make this move. Ah, okay. Strange, okay. Um, but I'll go on to the to next. Um, the administrators do not have good relationships with the citizens, recursive relationships with the citizens, and the societal representatives do not have recursive relationships with their citizens. So these are our major holes in our recursiveness, major holes in our system, and major reasons why the laws that are come out of the system are not perceived as legitimate. Now on the street level, you have the same thing. There's not much back and forth between the administrators and the citizens. By the street level, I mean, uh, you know, the police or others. Um, so imagine, for example, um, that you were speeding or parking and you got a ticket. Wouldn't it be nice along with the ticket to have some explanation of why uh, the, the law that you made, uh, that you broke, was made in the first place? So, for example, um, I don't know what is true in Belgium. I know that the Germans don't have uh, speeding laws, but in the United States, we have speeding laws. If you got stopped for speeding, and along with a ticket came just a little piece of paper saying that the legislature had determined, had done its work, and saw that there were X number of deaths at 55 miles an hour, and a considerable number more at 65 miles an hour, and so it had decided on 55 miles an hour, that was the reason. And here's a space for if you think that that was not a good decision, write this in and write your name in, send it in, and you'd get, you'd get some sort of response. Some feeling that there was some, some ear, some listening, some, something going on at the other end, that it wasn't just the hammer of government coming down at you. If you're waiting at a government bureau, what about a little, a poster on the wall saying, you know, we have this many um, people coming to ask us for help every day, and we have this many numbers of civil servants to help you. Um, that's why there's such a wait. If you've got some suggestions about how we can make the wait um, a little bit less painful, please put them in the box and then actually act on those suggestions. So that there would be some sense of recursivity, some sense there was something I could do, some, some, some ear at the other end for my complaints about why I'm being treated so badly. So similarly, um, there, there is now recursive relationships, as I say, um, in the societal realm there. But again, the, as, as we've said over and over again now, the societal groups are not in recursive relationships, most of them, with their constituents. So the goal is to increase legitimacy by increasing recursive communication in the legislatures, at the policy making level of administrators, at the street level between administrators and citizens, and in the societal level, that is to say voluntary associations between the organizations and their members and other citizens. All of these links strengthening these links and making these links more recursive, making them more full of people listening to one another and responding to one another and caring about what each other says and uh, taking it seriously, that's going to be a way of making laws somewhat more legitimate. Now, you all are in a better position than I am to know how to make democracy more legitimate in your own bailiwick, your own neck of the woods. But maybe you haven't thought, given much thought to that. And I would urge you, I would in fact beg you, 
to take this question seriously and ask yourself, how can I make the democracy that coerces me more legitimate? How can I make that coercion more legitimate? For example, one of the things that makes coercion much less legitimate is corruption. And we know that some societies, some countries are much better at uh, dealing with corruption than others. We can learn from one another. Does uh, the Hertie and the Gothenburg School are both uh, working on how to learn from one another about how to reduce corruption. That's a very delegitimating feature of government. So I would conclude by urging you to think about the concept, make your own the concept of a free use good. A free use good, again, is a good in which once it's produced, anyone can use it. And that means that by and large, it will be underproduced compared to need. Because since anyone can use it once it's produced, most people don't contribute. Now, you folks are quite different from the average person. And I'm, possibly it was because those euros were imaginary um, that it made you so uh, blithely give. Um, but in the real world, as you know, you're not going to get the roads and harbors and the various laws you need simply by people voluntarily giving. People will do a great deal. They'll pick up litter, they'll do a, a great deal. But you often need just a little periphery of coercion around the outside to keep that solidarity and duty going. So as soon as you have a free use good, a good that you can, once you've produced it, everyone can use it, then you, as soon as you see that kind of good, you ought to say, where's the free rider problem? How is that free rider problem being solved? Is that free rider's problem being solved by duty? Is it being solved by solidarity? Is it being solved by some form of coercion? Is it being solved by some mixture of duty, solidarity, and coercion? And if coercion is involved, ask how legitimate that coercion is. And if it's not fully legitimate, ask how we can increase the legitimacy of that coercion. And that those ideas, you could do it possibly through teaching our legislators to negotiate better. You could do it possibly by bringing in more citizens in these deliberative uh, arenas, these mini publics, these deliberative mini publics, these citizens assemblies, where they talk to one another and just and come up with solutions that sometimes the legislators haven't even thought of, um, or make decisions that legislatures legislators are a little afraid of of making. For example, in Rome. They had to decrease hospital beds. Um, you know, they, they had many more hospital beds than they could use, and it was not efficient use of the taxpayers' money. But no politician wanted to advocate for the reduction of hospital beds in that particular politician's district. So they had a citizens' assembly, a deliberative poll in this case, in which people came together and discussed it and came up with a formula of how to reduce hospital beds. And then the politicians could say, well, it's not me, it's the citizens. They agreed. So when you have a hot button topic, um, one of these citizens assemblies can be very, very useful and make, make the decision more legitimate. And then recursive representation and trying to add, being creative about how we can add more recursivity, more learning, listening, more responding, more, more over and over and over iterative conversation between representatives, elected representatives and the citizens that elected them between administrators and their constituents, between legislators and administrators, uh, between the NGOs that are very important to today's government and their constituents. How can we make all that, that system more recursive? So those are the suggestions that I have, but I really urge you to come up with your own thoughts based on your own practical experience of democracy where you live. So that's, um, that's the goal, increase the legitimacy of state coercion. Um, and um, we need to think our way out of this, because if we don't, what you see in front of you is what we get. So thank you. Thanks so much.
Okay. Thank you, Professor uh, Mansbridge, for a very inspiring talk. So it, it's typical for what you do. You think about improving democracy. It's not science for the gallery, but there is something at stake here. You try to improve it. So we have uh, some questions, and I will ask you some questions with regard to your talk. The first thing is um, how we can uh, conceive of this recursive type of democracy in very large complex societies, because the examples you give are all on a very small scale, but we're thinking states here, we're thinking on a national level. So how can recursiveness work on, on, yeah, on the scale? It, it's as if you talk about Greek city-state democracies, but real life, millions of people, how can you do this? Well, as I said, in the, at least in a country as large as the United States, uh, you could do it um, and cover um, one quarter of the constituents in six years. And most of us live a good deal longer than six years in our adult life. And so that means that we would, could very well expect even the, in a country the size of the United States. Now, um, it would be in eight years if it were a larger country. It would be in 12 years if it was a larger country. Um, and I'm not saying that this would be the only mechanism that the one between elected representatives and their constituents. But even if you were just consulted once every 20 years, which would really uh, be able to get you quite a large uh, uh, constituency, large, you could cover quite a lot of ground. The very fact that you knew you might be consulted, that your friends would be consulted and so forth and so on, that would be, that would be helpful and it would be helpful to the representative as well. But I agree, we can't have just, we can't rely just on that mechanism. We're going to have to rely on a lot of intermediate groups. As I say, unions, collections of unions. Um, the EU has not done a bad job, actually, of, of in its negotiations, um, using a lot of societal groups. It's done, I think, a better job than probably most polities on um, of, that, of that, certainly, of, certainly, I, I would guess, I'm not 100% sure, I'd have to check with my comparativist friends, uh, but my, my guess is that the EU has done an actually better job negotiating about these issues with societal groups, coming up with consensus, building roads, bringing in Romania, Sweden, you know, et cetera, et cetera, figuring out priorities, figuring out uh, common ways of going about it. They've done a really quite good job what they haven't done is a good job about is having those those the organizations with which they have consulted then consult with their constituents. That wouldn't be difficult for those those organizations to do. It's just no one's really ever thought about it. So I think you can do this if you multiply the if you multiply the spaces um, of communication. It means that it takes time, and time is money. But if you think of legitimacy as a good that's worth paying for, then that time is maybe thought maybe we can, can maybe we can um, decide that that time is worthwhile. Don't forget um, that as our need for legitimacy is going up and up and up. If you look at trust in government and other measures, the actual supply of legitimacy is going down and down and down. So you've got increasing demand and decreasing supply. And as you know, what, what happens when you've got increasing demand and decreasing supply, the price goes up. So the price of every, so to speak, ounce of legitimacy has gone up. It's each little ounce of legitimacy is worth more. So it, we, we need to think we need to think about how to increase it across the board throughout our com complex systems, even very, very large systems, global systems. Most of the connections between citizens and their go the governments who participate in these global decision-making arenas are very thin, very thin. There hasn't been much attention. We make lots and lots of decisions on a worldwide level today but very little connection with the citizens, very little recursivity. And it's not impossible at all for uh, these, as I say, these particularly for these NGOs that are part of that uh, decision-making structure 
to begin to think about how do we communicate better with our own constituents. But, but no, I don't you... think it's, it's impossible. Of course, it's much more difficult the, the, the greater the scale, but it's not at all impossible and it's necessary. And, and also in terms of, of, I would say, time investment, because you say it, the price goes up, it, it, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of resources talking to citizens, especially the recursiveness. So talking with them and listening to them and again and again and again. So it's the cycle that takes a lot of time. Don't you think that sometimes citizens expect their politicians, if you think about representative democracy, to solve the problem? Don't bother with them and just they, so is it is it often worth the investment? Do you think it's worth the investment? And is, is it how should politicians, if you think about politicians, about the relationship between a representative and a constituency, how often should they do this? And and is should then they spend less time talking to their colleagues? Where, where should the where should the resources come from? Yes, where should the resources come from? Yeah. Exactly. A very good point. Well, I think it's contextual. In other words, yes, sometimes we absolutely do just want our representatives to go ahead and decide, for heaven's sakes, you know, don't, mm -hmm. yeah. don't bother with asking me. I don't know very much about it anyway. Just go ahead and decide that. What do you think we, what do you think I elected you for? Go ahead and decide and stop bothering me. <laughs> that would be true in many, many contexts. In some contexts, it's not so true. Uh, so we need to titrate and understand which context. But let's let's imagine, and of course it would be true, let's take these uh, representatives in the US uh, Congress, taking an hour. As you know, um, well, maybe, maybe you don't, maybe the people who are taking an hour to listen to me have got an hour. Um, but many people, think of the people who are not listening to me right now, they don't have an hour. Many of us don't have an hour. And those hours are precious and they're particularly precious among representatives. So where do you take away that, take, get that hour? I think, that we can recognize that the administrators do make make law. You know, um, in classic 18th century uh, vision of democracy, administrators don't make law. The legislators make law, and then the administrators only administer. There's, in fact, um, constitutions. The German constitution has no non-delegation clause. You, you, the legislature is not allowed to de delegate its powers. Well, that's nonsense. You have to delegate your powers to the legislature, or to the administration. Let's be a little bit more frank about that. Let's make the administrators more recursive and give the administrators more power. Or take England. A lot of the decisions in England are made by the cabinet. They're not actually made by the, um, the backbenchers, the, the, the members of parliament. The, so build on that, have the members of parliament be the interlocutor, what I call the interlocutors, those their job would be, and of course they are the people who run for office, so they're the kind of people who can speak um, with with constituents. They, they've self-selected as being the kind of person who can speak with constituents. Have the, the representatives be the people who speak with constituents, find out what they mean, explain what's going on in, in parliament to them, and then turn around and explain to their other legislators the way their constituents think and let the cabinet make most of the big decisions. So there are ways of delegating uh, parliamentary time um, that we haven't considered, I think, seriously. Okay. There are several people who ask questions about polarization. And, and because the trend towards polarization, so ideological polarization amongst elites and effective polarization amongst citizens that speak directly against recursive democracy because it's about not listening to one another, not respecting the other point of view. How do you see the relationship? How could the, the solutions that you and that we all think about solve that vicious circle, cycle of uh, polarization? Yes, well, I think they're one of the most, um, all of these randomly collect, collected groups have a tremendous role to play. Uh, these groups that are chosen by Democratic Lottery have a great role to play in this. Take the American One Room one that I showed you where the Democrats began to get a, mm -hmm. a greater understanding of cost and the Republicans began to um, be um, more favoring of immigration. Um, I was in a small group in one of those um, the way they're designed, 
the small groups ask quite one of their tasks, not only to discuss policy, but also to ask questions of the experts in the plenary sessions. And they come together around the designing of the question. It's very interesting. They begin to bond. People also speak about their own experiences with the laws and people begin to understand what, what many people haven't even ever encountered someone um, uh, from the other side. I mean, some, some people have people in their family and whatnot, but with family dynamics, um, you may just want to kick them out the door or not listen to them or whatever it might be. But these are designed to actually help people listen to one another. And what has never been done, and I've been advocating it for a few years, but it's a little tricky um, uh, technically. If you had people who went to these citizens assemblies um, give their opinions as they went in on a tablet in their first, what's called pre-survey, of time one surveys, the survey at the beginning, and then at, on a tablet answer the same questions at the end, then immediately you could have a computer calculated immediately and find out who changed his or her mind. And then you could immediately interview them and say, why did you change your mind? And then when you presented the findings to the public, instead of just presenting numbers, which is the way we, we do it now, X percent changed their minds, well, a little bit like that. Of course, that was a pretty dramatic diagram that I showed you. You don't usually get quite mm -hmm. that dramatic, but that was numbers. What I showed you was numbers. It wasn't reasons and it wasn't people. And I think if you could interview, interview people who changed their minds and broadcast that, well, I thought this going in and then I changed my mind because of this person said that or they showed me how, how this had affected them. And so then I, I changed my mind. I realized that no, I had only been looking at one part of the puzzle. If, if real people were videoed giving real reasons as opposed to just the numbers, I think that might help. We're talking small changes, but sometimes small changes are cumulative. Sometimes small changes can create a cascade of norm change. Um, I think we're gonna need a great deal more than just that, but that's one thing that could work. Uh, there's also someone who asks a question about the climate change problem and the free rider dilemma or the collective action. Isn't, isn't, aren't we confronted with a situation with climate change when there is individual free riders, there is collective free riding, there is state free riding, there is continent free riding, there is uh, developed countries against less developed countries free riding. So there is all kinds of comparisons. Can, one, can we ever solve this problem? The word solve is a very strong word. Contain um, climate solve change or at least... Solve means, so yeah. to speak, yeah. figure out a way of kind of getting yeah. rid of it. Yeah. Um, I, I think the chances that we will solve it are at the moment small. I think the chances that we can make headway on it are great. And I think that you're, whoever asked the question is absolutely right in um, is in pointing out all the different kinds of collectivities that can free ride. Yes. But surprisingly, I don't know how many of you in, in the audience today knew the dynamic of the collective action problem, the free rider problem, um, but many people don't. Um, and yet, as I say, it's, it's, it, it is to government as supply and demand is to economics. It is the fundamental logic it is the reason for government. And all through human history, we've had intimations of that, just the way before the logic of supply and demand was figured out. <laughs> you know, if it was a, a bad harvest, a year of bad harvest, everybody expected the prices to go up. So we, we've had intimations of it, but we haven't had the logic. We've had the logic since the middle of the last century, but we haven't actually applied it to our democracy uh, well enough. So some of you, may never have heard of the free rider problem, may never have heard of a free use good, please put it into your, your psyches. <laughs> Those of you who have heard about it, please put it into your understanding of democracy. I think the more we spread this understanding of this logic, the more likely we will be to make headway on the problem. Because if you don't understand if you don't understand supply and demand, you're going to make lots and lot, lots and lots of mistakes. If you don't understand the free rider problem, you're going to make lots and lots of mistakes, whether you're a collective or an individual. So I think that actually understanding the problem will get us somewhere. 
there's a question about solidarity. So solidarity requires that people have something in common. So there must be, uh, they must consider each other, they must be tolerant, there must be a, a perception of, of being equals and so on. So that, that having something in common in larger societies that are increasingly diverse, ethically, culturally, in many, many different respects, how can solidarity still be a cornerstone of that, of that spontaneous pro-social behavior that people have, if, so, if, if we are much more di diverse than before? Well, this is a good question, and Bob Putnam has actually shown mm -hmm. that um, more diverse societies uh, tend to have less trust in one another, and that mm -hmm. seems uh, reasonable. Um, so what do we do about it? Um, I think here's where there's a kind of um, a battle going on between, it, a battle, is, I don't mean to say an overt conscious battle, but between social media, which tends to polarize us, take us into our separate bu bubbles, and programs, um, well, maybe like this, or but anyway, anyway other programs, that movies and so forth, that show the human side of each, each of us, that show each other that we all are humans. And I think all of us have gone to see movies about people who are not like us at all and ended up crying in the theater or, or <laughs> rejoicing with the person who, you know, with the athlete who just broke the X, Y, Z barrier, no matter what ethnicity they were. So we all have these human ways of responding to one another. And um, I think the media and the ways we communicate with one another, we're going to have a lot uh, to, to either help or hurt in this struggle between, the, between polarizing us and letting us understand one another as human beings. Because understanding each other as human beings is, a, is, the, is a major, if, if not the major, core of solidarity. There is, a, I think, an interesting question. So uh, when we were sitting outside waiting for you to start uh, talking, we had a discussion about the, the sweeping reforms, sweeping policy reforms. Recursive politics probably leads to middle ground politics, to taking all interests into account, to kind of sensible center type of, how can big sweeping reforms like the New Deal still be done when you slow down the process, talk to everyone, wants, wants everyone to be on board. Can you still do the big, the big change, you think? Yes, I think you can. I think it's a common mistake to think that um, a deal, uh, deciding to go forward together, requires moving toward the middle. Think again of that Texoil example that I gave. It wasn't that they said, oh, okay, you know, you, um, I can't pay more than 500,000, you can't sell it of, of five, any less than 550,000, so how about 525,000? That wasn't acceptable to either of the sides. Coming to the middle, and this was Mary Parker Follett's great uh, insight, this, you know, it was a brilliant, brilliant insight. Uh, she was sitting in, um, she, as she wrote back in the t those days, she, uh, uh, she was sitting in the Harvard Library one day, and somebody came in. She was sitting next to the window. It was kind of hot in the room. And the guy said, um, can we open the window next to you? But that would have created quite a draft on her papers. So she said, well, hmm, you know, he could have won or I could have won. I could have said, I have this seat next to the window, you know, or he could have said, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm X, Y, Z in the hierarchy. I'm going to go speak to the head librarian. Or... Uh, we could have opened the window part way. Opening the window part way would have been, would have still made a draft on my papers and it wouldn't have given them the cool window. It wouldn't have given them a cool room. So neither of us would have succeeded by having the middle way be the way. So I suggested opening the window in the next room. There was no one in the next room. There was no one who needed, it was just a storage room. Open that window, that would cool the room out. I wouldn't have the draft. They went beyond the demands. The demand was she wanted the window closed, he wanted the window open. They went beyond those demands to look at the actual interests underneath, and they found that the interest could be satisfied by a creative solution. So that can happen if you think, if you if you allow yourself to think in a non-zero-sum way, allow yourself to think not just 
that has to be down the middle, move to the middle, but how can, what's really going on? What are the interests that we can satisfy if we get creative? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mansbridge. Okay, uh, before we move on to the presentation of the honorary degree of Professor Jane Mansbridge, we enjoy now some live music brought to us by the best baritone Wilfried van den Brande, who has performed uh, as an impressive soloist on Thank almost you. every major stage in Europe and worldwide. And Wilfried will be accompanied by Bart Rodens, a virtuoso multi-instrumentalist and owner of no fewer than 24 historical keyboard instruments who will play the piano for us today. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night Alive as you or me Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead I never died, says he I never died, says he The copper bosses killed you, Joe They shot you, Joe, says I Takes more than guns to kill a man, says Joe. I didn't die, says Joe. I didn't die. And standing there as big as life and smiling with his eyes, says Joe, what they forgot to kill went on to organize went on to organize Joe Hill ain't dead he says to me Joe Hill ain't never died a working man are out on strike at their side Joel is at their side From San Diego up to Maine In every mine and mill Where working men defend their rights It's there you'll find Joel it's there you'll find Joe I dreamed I saw Joe last night Alive as you or me Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead I never died, says he. I never died, says he. Another Paul Robson song, Man of Color. Lawyer, first man who, the first black lawyer in America, who was also a fantastic singer, especially known for this song, Holman River. an old man called the Mississippi That's the old man that I'd like to be What does he care if the world's got troubles What does he care if the land ain't 
Work while the white folks play, all in them boats from the dawn till sunset, getting no rest till the judgment day. Don't look up and don't look down, you don't best make the white boss frown. Bend your knees and bow your head and pull that rope until you're dead. Let me go away from the Mississippi. Let me go away from the white man boss. Show me that stream called the River Jordan. That's the old stream that I long to. Must know something, but don't say nothing. He just keeps rolling. He keeps on rolling along. He don't plantators. And then the plants and is soon forgotten. But old man river, he just keeps rolling along. You and me. We sweat and strain, bodies all aching and racked with pain. Take that barge and lift that pail. Get a little drunk and you land in jail. I get weary. Trying, I'm tired of living and scared of dying. But old man river, he just keeps rolling
Isn't it wonderful to be able to enjoy some live music? We heard two incredibly powerful songs, uh, powerful, uh, iconic Paul Robson songs brought to us by Wilfried van den Brande and Bart Rodens. Uh, and now it is time for another very important moment this evening. It is time to confer the honorary degree in social sciences. Rector Herman van Goetem will read the diploma text before honorary, honorary Dr. Nensbridge says a word of thanks. But first, let's watch the introduction video together. Het departement Politieke Wetenschappen wil een eredoctoraat geven aan Jane Mansbridge voor haar indrukwekkend werk over eigenlijk de manier waarop onze huidige democratie werkt, zou moeten werken, de dilemma's die erin zitten. Volgens Jane Mansbridge is democratie iets heel kwetsbaar, iets wat we moeten voeden, wat we moeten koesteren. Maar langs de andere kant ziet zij het ook als iets wat een permanente bouwwerf is. Wij stemmen niet zelf over beleid. Dat gebeurt door mensen die dat in onze naam doen, onze representanten. En dat proces van representatie, dat is waar Jane Mansbridge over werkt en echt uh, ja, richtinggevend werk gedaan heeft. We zeggen heel vaak politieke vertegenwoordiging, te schort iets aan het systeem. En dat is wat zij in politieke vertegenwoordiging adversary democracy noemt. De vraag is, wat, wat doen we dan om het systeem te verbeteren? Hoe kunnen we die democratie eigenlijk sterker, minder kwetsbaar maken. Je zou kunnen zeggen, representatie heeft er gewoon mee te maken dat burgers iets willen en dat het beleid dat dan doet wat de burgers willen. Zij zegt, ja, maar het gaat ook over de relatie, de communicatieve relatie tussen de vertegenwoordiger en de burgers. Burgers willen uiteraard dat het beleid hun wensen weerspiegelt, maar willen ook het gevoel hebben dat er naar hen geluisterd wordt. Dat politie, zelfs als ze niet doen wat ze willen, dat ze tenminste gehoord worden. Jane Mansbridge is altijd bezig geweest met vertegenwoordiging voor iedereen in een samenleving. En het feit dat alle belangen een plek moeten kunnen krijgen. Het is eigenlijk heel modern werk. Hè? Het is iemand die veel jaren op de teller heeft, maar als je kijkt wat ze doet, het sluit perfect aan bij de tijdsgeest, bij, bij het probleem waar we nu mee te maken hebben. En kan daarmee heel goed niet alleen een tijdsgeest, laten we zeggen, samenvatten, maar die zelfs vatten. Ze is de meesten eigenlijk altijd een stukje voor. Jane Mansbridge is een strafmadam. Mensen willen een democratie, maar ze hebben een probleem met de representanten en de manier waarop die zich tot hen verhouden. Ik denk dat dat de essentie is van politieke wetenschap. Het gaat over de kwaliteit van de democratie. Daarover werkt ze. Een groot deel van haar onderzoek gaat eigenlijk uiteindelijk om de hamvraag van hoe kunnen we komen tot een meer rechtvaardige, een meer gelijke, een meer gelijkwaardige samenleving. Dat gebeurt in Antwerpen binnen de faculteit sociale wetenschappen, binnen het departement politieke wetenschap, maar ook breder veel onderzoek naar vragen van gelijkheid. Er zijn heel wat raakvlakken tussen haar werk en wat bij ons gebeurt. De creativiteit waarmee ze verschillende modellen van representatie bespreekt die tegenover elkaar afzet en ook de normatieve complicaties en, en implicaties, de gevolgen daarvan, ja, die zijn echt inspirerend. Hier kunnen we hè, onderzoek doen, hier kunnen we echt mee naar politie gaan, hier kunnen we met politie over discussiëren, hier kun, dit kun je meten, dit kun je... En dat, dat is eigenlijk dat is geweldig. Je zou kunnen zeggen, het is toch een beetje een academische ster. De vragen die zij zich stelt en de scherpte waarmee zij op een absoluut niet dogmatische wijze de vinger op de wonden kan leggen en antwoorden formuleren, zij is theoretisch heel scherp. Maar ook langs de andere kant glashelder en doet dat op een niet-dogmatische manier. Aan wie anders zou je een eerdoctoraat willen geven? Dear Dr. Mountbridge, firstly, I would like to thank you. As rector of the University of Antwerp, I would like to thank you for accepting this degree of our university. It is a honor and a privilege for us. Your work is extremely important in these changing times, the insecure world facing a difficult future. Thank you for your work. It is a mission. Thank you for what you did. And now, the more official part of this ceremony. 
on the recommendation of the Faculty of Social Sciences and by decision of the Executive Board, the University of Antwerp confers upon Professor Jane Mansbridge, Charles F. Adams Professor of Political Leadership and Democratic Values at the Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard University, the degree of Dr. Honoris Causa in Political Science for her essential contribution to political theory about contemporary challenges to democracy, especially her work on a fragile equilibrium between representation, participation and equality and its translation into applicable principles for improving the bonds between citizens and their representatives, which have inspired both the discipline and society at large. Dear Professor Douglas Elmendorf, Dean of the Kennedy School of Government at the Harvard University, on behalf of the University of Antwerp and the Faculty of Social Sciences, I would like to thank you to participate in this ceremony, to help us in this way. And can I ask you to hand over the University of Antwerp's honorary medal and diploma of Dr. Honoris Causa in Political Science to Professor James Mansbridge. Thank you very much. Um, Honorary Dr. Mansbridge, can I invite you maybe to express some words at the ceremony. Thank you for that. Yes, I, I want to thank you very much for giving me this honorary degree. I accept it not only for my own work, but also in the name of all the scholars and activists who are today trying to make democracy work in our new century, a turbulent and sometimes frightening and highly demanding century. I'm particularly delighted to be accepting this honorary degree in Belgium because as some of you know, Belgium is a world leader in the experimentation to make democracy more robust and more capable of handling the challenges of today. Both the German speaking community or East Belgium and the Brussels region are developing examples of citizen deliberative assemblies drawn by democratic lottery. We don't know how these efforts will turn out but they show a commitment to the experimentation we need as we try to make the power our current democracies must wield, not only more legitimate in fact, but also perceived as more legitimate. All my life, I've studied democracy in order to help make it better. This has been my own academic focus, and now it has become a collective effort. So I accept this degree with thanks as part of your university's recognition of the importance of our larger collective effort to increase the legitimacy of democracy for the great demands of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mansbridge. I would like to finish this evening by saying a few words of thanks. Thank you very much to Honorary Dr. Jane Mansbridge for your impressive work, for the interesting masterclass and for accepting our honorary degree. Thank you also to the Universities of Antwerp's Rector Herman van Goetem, to Dean Elmendorf of the Harvard Kennedy School, to Dean Petra Meyer and to the Faculty of Social Sciences. Finally, of course, I'd also like to thank you all for joining us this evening. Let's hope that in 2022, we can once again fill the Aula Rector Danis to celebrate our honorary doctors in person. I hope to see you there and then. <laughs>